Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and this is my Fender Champ amplifier. There are many like it, but this one is mine. It was purchased at a garage sale and then fixed up by my grandfather. We'll look at the Fender Champ schematic later in this lecture. This is the first lecture in which we will look at phase splitter circuits. Next week, we'll look at a kind of phase splitter called the long tail pair. And here we're going to look at one called either the cathodyne or the concertina. I'm mostly going to use the term cathodyne. A cathodyne is basically an extension of the cathode follower that we looked at in the previous lecture. And I'm going to assume that you've seen the lecture on self-biased cathode followers already. If you haven't, you can probably still pick up some tidbits, but I would recommend going back and checking out that lecture if you haven't already. As a bit of a review, we split the cathode resistance into two separate resistors, and you can take the output from two different points. I've mostly seen people take the output directly from the cathode, though. In this practical self-bias scheme for the cathode follower, we connect the grid leak resistor to this middle point between the two cathode resistances instead of directly to ground. This allows RK prime to control the grid to cathode voltage, and it also gives us a neat effect in that it gives us an extremely high input impedance that's a lot bigger than RG itself. The input voltage here is being copied at this point, albeit with a loss, and it's important that there is a little bit loss, that this isn't unity gain or higher, because this is positive feedback after all. But the net effect is you have two small signal voltages that are very close to each other, so very little current is actually flowing across RG, so it looks like there's a very, very big input impedance here. So, that combined with the really low output impedance means that this makes a very good voltage buffer. Because this particular self-bias scheme puts a pretty high bias voltage here at the grid, we need an explicit AC coupling capacitor to separate that high DC bias voltage from the ground referenced input or whatever reference the input has. So, with that review out of the way, let me show you what extensive changes we need to make to turn this into a cathodyne. Whoop, that's it. All we do is take another output here, and now you can see why I changed the output markings here to VO+. Plus. VO+, plus is the non-inverting output. VO- minus is going to be the inverting output. And the general approach is to set up RL, RK prime, and RT such that VO minus has the same magnitude as VO plus, just a different sign. Or I guess VO minus should have the same magnitude as VO plus alt if you are using this alternate output. So we have a nice voltage buffer that gives you an original buffered signal and an inverted version of that signal. The long-tailed pair we are going to look at next week gives you these non-inverted and inverted outputs, but can also provide gain. In any case, why do you want the same signal but with just different signs? Well, for that, I need to actually jump ahead in the class a little bit and talk about power amplifiers. So this is the schematic of one variation of the Fender Champ. It's probably not the exact model that I actually own. Like with all of its amplifiers, Fender made many variations of the Champ over the years, but they all have the same basic structure. We have the power supply down in the bottom of the schematic here. We have something called the death capacitor that we'll look at in a later lecture. And this is death as in die, dead, bad thing, not death as in death metal. Anyway, there is a transformer here. There's a tube rectifier. We'll look at this sort of thing later in the class when we talk about power supplies. Notice there's no voltage regulator per se. You have a series of resistors that are designed to drop the voltage down to what the various stages of the amp need, and each of those basically has a capacitor acting as a filter to try to keep the power supply clean. In any case, this power supply scheme is kind of loosey-goosey. It can't really keep up when you hit a massive power cord, and that's part of the sound of the amp. There's a brief sag in the volume, and then there's this bloom effect as the power supply is struggling to keep up and starts to keep up, and that's part of the coolness of the sound.
Something I don't think I've mentioned in previous lectures is that the 12 AX7 is actually a dual tube. It's two triodes in one. And here both halves of the 12 AX7 are common cathode amplification stages. It's a bit hard to see at first because the upper rail voltage is actually down here. We usually write this like a load resistance going up to our upper rail voltage. Incidentally, that upper rail voltage is sometimes called B+, especially on older schematics and data sheets. This way of writing the power supply voltage down here, kind of around where the ground lives, is something that's common in a lot of older schematics. I personally find it very difficult to read. It takes a while to get used to. Often I'll grab a pencil and just redraw a circuit if I'm trying to figure it out. So that was all a bit of an aside to provide some context for what I'm about to talk about, which is the power amplification stage. We'll look at power amps in detail later in the class. For right now, just think about it as a common cathode stage like you're used to, except instead of driving a load resistance for voltage amplification, you're driving one of the windings of a transformer in order to drive a speaker. So. Instead of just providing voltage gain, you're actually providing power to do work. You're actually moving a speaker coil. Now, you can do that with something like a 12AX7, but it's really not designed to push the kind of current that you really want in order to actually drive a speaker. So for that, you use something like the 6V6. This is not a triode. This particular one is called a beam tetrode. There's also pentodes. I'll talk about those sorts of things later. In any case, the problem with this stage is that there's always a biased current running through here. Now, there's always a biased current running through these preamp stages too, but it's not really that big of a deal. It's not that much of wasted power, but there's a lot of wasted power in this kind of scheme, just having this biased current constantly dropping over that 470 ohm resistor. A more efficient scheme is something called a push-pull configuration, where you have two tubes instead of one driving the output transformer, and each of them is basically responsible for half of the waveform. So when one of the tubes is operational, the other one is cut off. And this is a lot more efficient. You don't have this bias current that's being wasted all the time. We'll look at the details of these sorts of things in future lectures. For now, just know that the main problem is that we don't have complementary pairs with tubes. We basically have the equivalent of NPN transistors for BJTs or NFETs in the case of MOSFETs or JFETs, but in the tube realm, we don't have anything like an equivalent of a PNP or a PFET. With transistors, you can use complementary pairs, like here we see an NPN transistor with a PNP transistor, and you can apply your signal to the inputs of both transistors. If you try to build this with just NPNs or just PNPs, you would have to invert one of the inputs. That's one of the challenges we have in working with tubes, which is why we need phase splitters. So here in the Fender Princeton, we see this cathodyne stage consisting of a 12AX7 that has a coupling capacitor connecting its input to the output of a standard common cathode gain stage. And the non-inverting and inverting outputs of the cathodyne are capacitively coupled to the inputs of the beam tetrodes in the power output stage. Again, we'll look at all the stuff to the right of this line here later in the class. Okay, so I just spent five minutes motivating why we need cathodynes. Let's look at the actual cathodyne. So here we have what I called our K prime. That's the one kilo ohm resistor here. And this 56K, this is what I called a tail resistor, RT. Here we have our grid leak resistance. That's one mega ohm. All of our analysis assumed that this grid leak resistor was a lot bigger than either of these resistances. So RL, the load resistance on the plate side, that's 56 kilo ohms. And again, it's a bit tricky to see here because this 290 volt 
upper rail voltage is drawn down here on the schematic instead of at the top the way we're used to. Remember in the last lecture when we were looking at the cathode follower and the dumbbellator, this load resistance here was zero, and that's typical if you're just using it as a cathode follower. Okay, so what's the first thing we do when we analyze a circuit like this? We plot a load line. Remember that at DC, this capacitor acts as an open circuit. We're assuming no current is flowing through the grid, so there's no current flowing through this one mega ohm resistor. So all of the current is flowing through these resistors and the triode. So at one extreme, we can assume that all of the voltage is dropping across the triode, and that's the zero current case. At the other extreme, we can assume that none of the voltage is dropping across the triode and that all of it is dropping over the resistors. So I would compute a current of 290 volts divided by the sum of the 56K down here, the 56K over here, and this 1K resistor, giving me 290 volts over 113 kilo ohms or 2.566 milliamps. So I now have a point on the horizontal axis and one on the vertical axis. And if I draw a line connecting those, I get this DC load line. So now I need to draw a grid line and I need to try to pick some grid to cathode voltages to try. Let's try something like one volt. So one volt over one kilo ohm, remember this RK prime here, this 1K, is what's defining our grid current relative to the grid to cathode voltage. And so if I compute that, I get 1 milliamp. And if I were to instead, say, have 1.5 volts dropping across that resistor, if I divide that by 1 kilo ohm, that gives me 1.5 milliamp. Notice I used to always write a couple of minus signs here. I know that these wind up canceling, so here I just haven't bothered. All right, so now if I plot the one milliamp and 1.5 milliamp points on the one volt and 1.5 volt lines, or I should say the minus one volt and the minus 1.5 volt lines, I get a grid line that looks like this. Intersecting those, I see that we have a quiescent current of 1.15 milliamps and a quiescent plate to cathode voltage of 160 volts. Now, let's do some sanity checks. We read 160 volts off the graph, but somebody conveniently wrote these various test voltages on the schematic. And I always like to start by assuming that we don't know these things, compute some values, and then see if the values we computed are consistent with the values already written on the schematic. So for the plate to cathode voltage, we have 220 volts minus 65 volts from the schematic, and that gives us 115 volts. I would say that's close enough to the 160 volts that we read off the graph. And another place that we can check this out is to say, well, what's the grid to cathode voltage? Well, let's see. We have 63.8. At least I think that's an 8. Close enough minus 65, that gives me minus 1.2 volts. And let's see, if I were to imagine trying to fit a curve here, this is between the minus one and the minus 1.5 volt line, it's closer to the minus one line. That could be probably something like minus 1.1 or minus 1.2 volts, something like that. It looks like we're in the ballpark. Okay, so what about the current? I read 1.15 milliamp on the graph. And if we look at the schematic, there are several places we could try to estimate the current based on the written voltages. I could take a look at this 56K resistance here. So 290 volts minus 220 volts gives us 70 volts. And dividing those gives us 1.25 milliamps. Another thing I could do is I could look at this 1K resistance, and there's a difference between the voltage is written on either side of 1.2 volts, so that gives me 1.2 milliamps. Or I could take a look at this 56K resistor down here and say, well, it looks like there's 63.8 volts dropping across it, giving me 1.14 milliamps. So it looks like I'm generally in the ballpark. Probably 1.2 milliamps is a good figure. 
I'm going to go ahead and use this 1.15 for the rest of the computations. And you'll see when we look up that on the graph, it's not like it's going to be a whole lot different than really any of these anyway. So close enough for rock and roll. So looking up our small signal parameters on the trusty 12AX7 data sheet, if I check out this 1.15 milliamp mark, not surprisingly, mu is 100. But what about the plate resistance? Let's see. So the green line intersects this RP line at 64 kilo ohm. So that's what I'll use in our computations. So at this point, I can just start plugging numbers into the formulas we've derived in previous lectures. So the small signal gain for the output at the cathode is this expression. And plugging in all of our various values, I wind up with 0 0.96988. I guess you could call that 0 0.97. I'm being a little absurd with these significant digits here. Anyway, something close to 1, but not quite 1. And now if we were to look at the output impedance and plug in the values for that expression, I wind up with 1.16 something kilo ohm. So this isn't quite as small as the super small output resistance we got from the cathode follower. And that arises from the fact that we do now have an RL on the other side, but it's still pretty small. This is pretty good. Now, what about the plate side? If I were to plug our numbers in for this formula that we computed for the common cathode stage, I wind up with minus 0 0.95 something something something. So again, this is pretty close to a magnitude of 1, not quite, but pretty close. Now remember, we've previously looked at common cathode stages as means of getting big amounts of gain. Here, we're deliberately using a really big cathode resistance in order to keep the gain actually to be less than one. So this is a very different use of this kind of formula. Now, if we look at the output impedance, we have a very different story than with the non-inverting output. Here, the output impedance is around 54 kilo ohm. So, as far as the magnitude of the small signal output goes, these are very similar between the two outputs, but there's not really a symmetry here. We do have very different output impedances, and that's not really a problem if the rest of the circuit that you're feeding understands that and takes that into account. If you're feeding the inputs of things that have very high input impedances, this doesn't really matter. Now, it's a different story next week when we look at long-tailed pairs because the outputs of a long-tailed pair have output impedances that are more similar to each other.